this is just part. We got the old ones. The old ones are back. They don't sound better. Oh, really? Good evening. Since 5.30, the Board of Education has been in closed session uh, for the purposes of um, employment, appointment, compensation, discipline, performance, or dismissal of specific employees, the sale or purchase of securities, investments, or investment contracts, the setting of a price for sale or lease of property owned by the district, collective negotiating matters between the district and its employees or their representatives, security procedures and the use of personnel and equipment to respond to an actual threat, and student disciplinary cases, although no action has been taken on student disciplinary cases, and we are going to have to go back after the meeting. So um, I am... Um, taking Terry's place he had a professional obligation um, that took him out of town and I know Mike Inch is working as well so it is all of the all of us this evening and we're glad to be here um, our mission is to educate students to be self-directed learners collaborative workers complex thinkers quality producers and community contributors roll call mrs. Ms. Bell oh we got to come out of close I, I haven't done this in a while I told you uh, I need a motion to come out of closed session <laughs> All in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you. All right. And I did the mission, and now roll call, Ms. Bell. Sure. Student Ambassador President Kevin Angel, Board Members President Kristen Fitzgerald, Susan Crotty, Susan Price, Donna Wannake, and Jackie Romer. Please stand as you are able to recite the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God indivisible with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Good news, Mr. Bridges. Good news. So just about a year ago, I was sitting here very nervous and anxious for the Sunday about to come because I was running the half marathon. <laughs> so the, the best news is, is that I'm not doing that this year. But I guess some really good news is, is that, as you all know, that next Sunday, uh, the Healthy Driven Naperville Half Marathon and Marathon will take place. Uh, and while that may not seem like good news for District 203 itself, mm -hmm. uh, the fact that, uh, once again, there will be a team of runners from District 203's community uh, supporting the Naperville Education Foundation as their charity uh, when they run. We have 31 registered runners 
who represent uh, various relationships to the district, so we're very proud of them. You can go to the District 203 website, uh, and there's a button in the upper right-hand corner uh, to support Team NEF if you'd like to do that. All those donations then that they are, the money that they raise uh, and collect goes to support Naperville Education Foundation, which in turn then uh, is supports District 203 students. So first of all, best of luck to those that are running, and thank you so much for choosing uh, Team NEF and the Naperville Education Foundation to be your team of choice. So that's good news. Good luck. Good. Um, we have public comment. We have not received any um, slips. Is there anybody who would like to speak who did not submit a slip? No? All right. Then we will move on to our communications. And we have student ambassador reports and one student ambassador. Um, I'd like to begin by discussing uh, some good news about sports at Naperville Central. Uh, the girls' cross-country team qualified for sectionals and competed last Friday. Uh, the boys' cross-country team qualified for sectionals. They won fifth at sectionals and are advancing to state. Uh, boys' football advanced to playoffs and won their game against Bolingbrook on Friday, and they're advancing and will play again on Friday. Boys' soccer beat, uh, won in their super sectional game and will advance to quarterfinals uh, later this week. The n note, we have a, our school's annual blood drive tomorrow. Um, students have the opportunity to donate blood throughout the day. They sign up for a time ahead of time, and they uh, have collected a good bit of blood th uh, each year. Another note is that we have the fall play on the 5th, 6th, and 7th of November, and it's Don't Drink the Water, and it will be previewed to students during the Wednesday before. Um, and then finally, the Naperville Central has its annual Veterans Day assembly during second period on November 11th, Veterans Day, and classes, teachers have the option to bring their students to the auditorium for the presentation, and many of our teachers do go, so. Thank you. Uh, Here we have one, uh, we have one report this evening, so I'll invite uh, Principal Patrick Gaskin to come forward to the presentation table. Uh, as you're aware, monthly, uh, during our work meeting, we invite one of the principals, one of, one of our schools, to come to the Board of Education and provide you with an update on their school improvement initiatives and the work that they're doing uh, at their school. So this evening we have the pleasure of having the principal from Lincoln Junior High School, Patrick Gaskin, here uh, to update you on the work that's going on at Lincoln Junior High School. So we'll turn it over to Patrick. All right. It is my pleasure. Uh, to provide you with a snapshot of our efforts at Lincoln Junior High School to move student learning forward. I'm proud of the success that our students have had and all of the success that we have experienced as a school community the past few years. It's truly been a collaborative effort between our students, our parents, and all of the amazing teachers that we have the pleasure of working with on a daily basis. Our Rising Star team is composed of various professionals who have a variety of teaching and educational experiences. These individuals have demonstrated leadership by disseminating information to various departments, grade levels, and analyzing student data, and also by providing professional development on our school improvement plan days. We utilize a continuous improvement cycle to ensure we stay focused on our indicators, on the implementation of our tasks, and more importantly, on student learning. Our team meets strategically on a regular basis to assess where we are at, to plan and to make needed adjustments along the way. We are committed to designing and implementing effective practices to promote meaningful learning experiences for all Lincoln Junior High School stakeholders. This process also ensures that our efforts clearly align to the strategic areas of focus in the district's strategic blueprint. As you know, indicators are evidence-based practices of high-performing schools. Our research revealed nine indicators to possibly include in our school improvement plan based on our priorities as a school community and based on our current levels of implementation. Next, we utilized a priority grid to identify which indicators we would make part of our formal school improvement process. Lastly, a strengths inventory helped each of our Rising Star members with alignment to an indicator that was really based around their individual areas of strength. Our first indicator, CL7, really deals with the environment of the school our second indicator, III A07, is related to differentiation and student performance. And our last indicator, ID10, is related to looking at data to drive our instructional practices and our professional development needs as a community. This is one artifact that our Lancer Pride Committee developed. It aligns to our first indicator, CL7. 
and it's a behavior matrix that we will be introducing to staff and students in the near future. Research shows that by clearly communicating student expectations instead of telling students what not to do, we'll increase a more positive and cohesive culture within our school community. Our Pride Committee redeveloped our Lancer Pride Character Education Program. Our committee worked diligently to create a consistent set of behavioral expectations for students throughout the school day and during extracurricular activities. We also developed and distributed a student survey that was based on the school culture, the school environment, and student experiences in a variety of settings to identify descriptors in our Lancer behavioral matrix. Another way in which we are implementing our first indicator, CL7, and communicating our efforts is by increasing our use of social media on Twitter. On the left, you will see a tweet of our last collaborative efforts as a staff on our Institute Day, learning about social emotional learning standards. On the right, you will see a tweet promoting our Lancer Pride recipients in the month of October. These are two more examples of how we're implementing CL7 at Lincoln Junior High School. Our next indicator, III AL7, deals with differentiation. And this is an artifact that demonstrates how our seventh grade ELA teachers are differentiating assessment for our students. Students were able to select their preferred novel study assessment option based on their VARC learning preferences. The acronym VARC stands for Visual, Auditory, Read, Write, and Kinesthetic Sensory Modalities that are used for learning information. The VARC is an online learning preference survey that our seventh grade students take at the beginning of the year, and teachers use this data to better understand their students' learning needs learning styles, and effectively differentiate lessons and assessments. This is another example of our second indicator around differentiation, where our uh, math department uses a pre-assessment at the beginning of each, um, each of the units in math, and this year this was, was around our review standards at the onset of the school year. On the left, you will see how our math teachers utilize a pre-assessment at the beginning of each unit to determine student readiness and mastery. And on the right, you will see how students were grouped accordingly in three different groups, A, B, and C, with different learning activities and tasks each day underneath related to the standard. Group A would be considered the non-proficient group with different learning activities each day. Group B would be the proficient group. And group C would be the extension group. Again, these groups were created based on the pre-assessment survey that was administered at the onset of the unit. This artifact is baseline data that was collected using the pre-assessment and how students would be grouped instructionally. Please focus your attention to the bottom row in yellow. As you can see on day two, this student was in a non-proficient group or group A with the first standard, a proficient group on day three in the second standard, which would be group B, and then an extension group, group C, for the remaining standards in the unit. The seventh grade math teachers also assess at the end of each unit to measure student growth. This is an example of one of the ways that we are using our performance series reading data that ties to our last indicator, ID10. If the average score of a subgroup is significantly below the overall average score, then it is often described as, a, as the phrase achievement gap. The first thing to notice is that on average, our African American students in this subgroup are starting out lower performing in the fall of each of the three years listed. This could be for two reasons. The incoming sixth grade group would be lower performing than the exiting eighth grade group. The second reason is the achievement gap could also be widening for these students. Let's take a look at the gap itself. The students in the fall of 2012 started off 102 points, points lower than the overall average for Lincoln. In 2012-2013 school year, the percent of students who met their expected growth target was 48% from the fall to the spring. Statistically, we would expect 50% or higher. So the gap actually widened to 128 points in the, sp in the spring of 2013. If you focus your attention to the fall of 2013-2014, the gap widened from 147 to 163 points. For 2014-2015, the gap widened from 214 points to 223 points. Let's take a look at this same subgroup but in the area of math. You will notice on average the students were starting out lower performing in the three years that are listed. However, you can clearly see that the achievement gap is narrowing. For 2012-2013, African American students in math had their gap widen from 122 points to 155 points, different from the overall average. However, 
For 2013, 2014, the gap narrowed from 193 points to 172 points. For the fo or for 2014, 2015, the gap narrowed again from 251 points in the fall to 225 points in the spring. We have seen similar results for our IEP subgroups, our Hispanic subgroups, and our free and reduced lunch subgroups in the past year in areas both in reading and math. This is a huge celebration for our students, for our staff, and this clearly dis demonstrates that our PLCs, our professional development, and our use of data to inform instructional differences is making a positive difference for our students at Lincoln Junior High School. I'd like to take a moment to acknowledge Tim Waringa and Molly Farmer who are instrumental in assisting our staff in moving learning forward around our data analytics systems. Our LSC and myself met with Molly this summer to answer various questions that our staff had around utilizing Pinnacle Insight and utilizing our performance series data. At our last SIP day, our staff divided up and identified students that were lower performing in quartiles one and two in each of the subgroups listed on the left in the areas of reading and math. Next, they were to individually list strategies and differentiating activities that they were utilizing to close the achievement gap for those students. In the last column, they would take this document to their PLC and they would be discussing how they're going to differentiate instruction and measure student growth in preparation for our winter performance series window, which happens in January. This year, we provided a product calendar to guide our PLC's professional learning conversation and to ensure our efforts aligned not only to our Rising Star plan, but to the strategic plan. Our PLC structure allows for collaborative conversations amongst various departments to discuss students' SEL needs, review a variety of assessment data, and to craft instructional plans to meet the increasingly diverse needs of our students. This was a list of outcomes that they should focus their conversations around during their PLCs. As I mentioned earlier, we strategically aligned our continuous improvement cycle to the four strategic areas of the blueprint. Rising Star is our continuous commitment to the school improvement cycle at Lincoln Junior High School. In many ways, our Rising Star plan is like a GPS system. It shows you where you are at relative to your destination, provides you detailed routes for achieving it and reaching it, and adjust to variations and even accommodations along the way. We are very fortunate to have so many people that want to assist us, like students, parents, various community members, local, federal, and state agencies, District 203 cabinet members, and the Board of Education. School improvement is a marathon, not a sprint. Following our continuous improvement cycle process, we already identified next steps to move student and adult learning forward at Lincoln. Our first indicator, CL7, on the bottom of the arrow here, is becoming embedded in our daily work, and we are close to full implementation of this indicator. As I shared earlier with the artifacts related to our three indicators and the data slides that I shared, we have identified the work that needs to be accomplished. Therefore, our Rising Star team went back to our original work and reviewed our priority grid to identify a new indicator. IIAO6 at the top of the arrow will be our next indicator, which relates to teaching uh, teachers looking at evaluation methods and obviously the results to move student forward or learning forward at Lincoln Junior High School. Thank you for allowing me to present our Rising Star Plan and I'm able to answer any questions that you might have. Yes. Hi, Pat. It's always good to see you, and I learn something new every time I see you. Thank so, you. Thank you. If you would go back to the um, the slides that have the um, the math and the reading performance series, can you explain to me? Is this a cohort group, or is this a different group each year? It is a diff. It's a different group. So, so these I'm are seventh graders each year. No, it's six. It would they would be sixth grade in 2012, okay. seventh grade in 2013, and then eighth grade in 2000. So these are the same kids roughly. I mean, some mm -hmm. might move in, some might move out. Correct. So is so when I look at where they start, where their baseline is, mm -hmm. like so on the on the reading, they start at 2900. The next year they're at just below 2850, and then at 28. Mm -hmm. Is that reason for concern? I think there is a reason for concern and it shows that students are regressing from when they exit school in the spring and when they return to us in the fall. Tim, do you want to add something? You yeah, I just, just to add to it, and um, I think Patrick's done a nice job of working with the staff to say zero in on this data as being 
the place where he wants to focus some time on because uh, there's a lot of great data here and also that he's looked at. And in this, what he's, what he's found, again, these are uh, sixth, seventh, and eighth graders together in each of those years. So as he mentioned, so they're, Got it. when the eighth graders graduate, a new group of sixth graders come in like he was explaining. Got it. And so are there things that you're gonna do differently to address kind of the summer regression? Yes, we have talked a little bit about um, assessing students and how we're really differentiating their instruction to meet their needs. Our new ELA curriculum allows for more of a workshop model where we can kind of zero in and target in on individualized instruction for small groups of students, no matter where they're at um, and related to their reading or math needs. And in your set that you're looking at, about how many people are in each set? Well, it, it depends on each grade level and right. if you look at each quartile based on reading or math. So there could be, at some grade levels, zero students that are in those quartiles for reading or for math, and then in other grade levels, there could be many students. 20? Uh, not as many as 20 that we've okay. identified. So it's a very small sample that you're showing us. That's what I was, that, right. that in was. Each, in each grade level or on each team. Yes, yes. okay, that's all I was looking for. Mm -hmm. that's, it's interesting, it's, um, it's such a different way of looking, of looking at things. It's really dissecting it um, differently. So thank right, you. and we talk a lot about that our, our needs are changing and our students are changing, but we need to know like who our customers are <laughs> and we need to know exactly where they're at and who those kids are that are in front of us that need additional support. Well, if anyone treats the students like and their families like their customers, it's you. Well, thank you. So, thanks, Pat. <laughs> Thank you so much, Pat, for all the data and mm -hmm. all the information. Um, what was interesting to me is, that I haven't seen um, was when you spoke to differentiation, we've talked a lot here with other school improvement plans about differentiation um, in regard to student performance. What mm -hmm. I love, and I'd love you to speak to a little bit more because I think that it has a um, very strong correlation, is your differentiation for student learning styles because that I don't think we've seen. Like we've seen it in relation to performance and have it like you did with the math, um, you know, where there was the pretest and then the differentiated groups. Mm -hmm. That's more directed at performance. But the thing right, the, the slide right before it where we talked about the different ways that students can be assessed really spoke to their learning styles and you spoke to it a little bit. But I'm just curious if um, as you meet with other um, principals in the district if, if this is something that's unique to um, Lincoln as far as differentiation goes or if you've seen it in other, uh, other schools? I specifically have not seen it in other buildings but I know that it's occurring because I actually met with a staff member from Washington today and we had a conversation around how they use that same VARC assessment for their sixth grade students and how she didn't realize that she had so many kinesthetic learners in her class and that really kind of um, opened her eyes to the learning activities that she was providing and by doing that she said that she feels that students are making more growth at a faster rate and she wouldn't have actually known that if she didn't actually administer the same well, assessment. I'm, thank you because I'm excited to see that we're looking at differentiation in both aspects the mm -hmm. performance and the um, for the student learning style because I think it they go so closely hand in hand but I, I we've only heard of it in regard to performance so thank you and kudos to Lincoln. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Hi, thanks for being here. No problem. Um, I just have a couple of follow-up questions on the um, differences between your reading and your math progress. Okay. Um, so in your math progress, it looks as if y you noted the summer slide impact in terms of, in both, actually in both reading and math, mm -hmm. where students are coming in a little bit lower than they were when they left. Um, and in the math area, it looks as if you've made progress in each of these years in closing that gap despite the fact that it's starting lower. Mm -hmm. On the reading side, um, it's bigger. So I'm wondering, I know that reading um, is such a difficult thing to get at. The studies um, that I've read talk so much about how the people who read more just keep getting better at reading mm -hmm. and the people who aren't reading as much, it's like it's a cum cumulative impact. Um, what kinds of things are you doing to get at this um, situation where you're not seeing them improve through the year? The gap is, well, they're improving, 
but the gap is widening. Mm -hmm. um, what kinds of things are you working on in terms of, um, are you looking at um, role modeling with you know, teachers or um, ways of making reading more attractive to students? Or are you working with other junior highs? Do they also see similar kinds of trends? Um, where they might have creative ideas to um, get at that because, you know, we can't control whether or not somebody reads over the summer. Well, we can. We can give them sure. good summer offerings, sure. which we're working on, and I know we have that report later. Mm -hmm. um, but in terms of helping them to have that passion for reading um, that will help them so much to continue to improve. Well, I think it really boils down to our teachers knowing our students and what they're truly interested in in reading About. and making sure that we're providing them with those types of genres. Our teachers encourage our students, obviously, to read over the summer. There's many offerings for students to get involved. Not only are our classroom teachers doing that, but also like our strategic reading and math teachers are also mm -hmm. doing that. Um, we also promote, obviously, summer school because we think that's a great extension to the school year. And we've seen an increase in our student population attending summer school, which is obviously a positive thing. So we're hoping by that, along with our new ELA curriculum, mm -hmm. that we'll see some great gains, just like we have seen in the areas of math. And like you said, reading is a very complex task. And the only way to get better at something is to, to be in front of it and do it more frequently. Like we can relate that to a sports al analogy. If you want to become a better basketball player, really the only way to become a better basketball player is to play more basketball. So we kind of approach it in the same way of, of reading and making sure that we're finding high interest text for mm -hmm. our students and promoting that in a positive fashion. Mm -hmm. Because reading is, is a difficult task and the last thing we want to do is turn students away from that. Thank you. You're welcome. Maybe this is more for Tim. Or Pat, feel free. <laughs> As we're looking at the, your, I'm not looking at the gap so much. I just want to make sure I'm understanding and reading the, the graph correctly. As we're looking at the blue um, overall comparisons, mm -hmm. from. Or, or, is it mathematically sound to be able to compare year to year, and should we see an increase each year, or no? I the, they're different students, but the same grades. So um, if our curriculum is having an impact at the elementary level, then you would hope you would see, even though they're different students, you would see it progressing upward, because that would mean that different groups of students would come into Lincoln having improved and then continue to progress, um, but you would the expectation would be that they would be about the same each time. So it's it's actually good progress to see in the, you're referring to the blue, right. the, the first number starting, those are the sixth and seventh graders in the fall, their scores are increasing, which is improving, but they're different kids. Okay. Thank you. Um, Patrick, you had uh, answered my question that I was going to ask about summer school because we're getting a report tonight for mm -hmm. summer school for 16. Um, and, you know, summer school didn't always have a great, um, or it had a reputation that it was more remedial and no longer is that the case, and especially if you look at the offerings uh, on the report tonight, mm -hmm. um, they're all across the board. Um, so if you ever come up with, I'm not asking you to answer this right now. Okay kind of a cool way for kids to get involved and you know whether that is a competition or something if you can just pass that along because there's nothing that's probably been one of the most impactful things for me to watch over the last year or two just how we've helped with transportation we've helped uh, break down all the barriers and some of the stigma that went with summer school and some of the summer programs are for very you know uh, science programs and all they fill up quickly um, they're really exciting if you ever think of something like that pass it on down I know you would anyhow but I'm just hearing what you're hearing and how well you know your students mm -hmm. um, please pass that on all right will do awesome thank you thank, thank you for your report it was awesome thank you All right, thank you very much. Lovely rest of your week. You guys do the same. Have a good night. Thanks. Thank you. That's what we have. Okay. Uh, president's report, there is no president's report. Does anybody have any Board of Education reports? Um, I think we've commented among ourselves, but just so um, the world knows, uh, the Future Focus 203, which was um, on Wednesday evening and Thursday morning this past week, you know, I know when people hear about them, they think, oh, state of the district. I, I can't already know that and all. Um, 
do try, if you can, attend these. This last one on um, digital learning and what is happening in a classroom and just the stories the teachers told how education delivery and their and these are seasoned teachers, how their world has changed and how excited they are and from the student's perspective. So kudos to the huge group here that put that together. Kudos, uh, yes, to the, to the team in this building that worked on planning that, but uh, even greater kudos when we plan to recognize at a future meeting um, the staff and the kids who were involved in awesome. presenting the information. Oh, that's because, great. You know, when we think about the strands of the mission statement, uh, they were fully representative of, of our mission statement and uh, what we aspire all of our children and our staff to do and be uh, every single day. It was uh, very well done. Uh, information is available on the website. So if you missed it, go to the DLI link and also to the Focus 203 link. Uh, and you can see, I think, is the video posted? Michelle's nodding her head yes. So the video is posted and information is posted as well. So it was a, was a worthwhile event. So thank you for that plug. Don't, don't. Okay. Then we'll move on to action by consent. Um, I will entertain a motion to approve 7.01. I move approval of uh, agenda item 7.01 adoption of personnel report. I have a motion, a second. Second. Motion and a second. Roll call. Robert? Yes. Fitzgerald? Aye. Wonky? Yes. Pratty? Abstain. Price? Yes. Thank you. Motion carries. And we are on to items eight, discussion uh, without action. Great. This evening, uh, our team is excited to present to the Board of Education uh, a report and our recommendations for Summer Learning 2016. Uh, you had heard reference in our last report uh, to uh, uh, opportunities for learning during the summer. and We view this as one of our uh, most important strategies to uh, address student learning for all. Uh, so this evening here uh, to present uh, for the first discussion on our uh, recommendations for this summer is our Director of Summer Learning, Kevin Okevich. Uh, he will walk you through uh, uh, the rationale really for this recommendation as well as what our recommendations will be for the summer. Uh, and then we will uh, uh, hear your questions, begin to try to address those questions, and then also note that we will be back uh, for discussion uh, again at our next meeting with action also. So I'll turn it over to Kevin. Great. Thank you. I'm grateful to sit before you tonight to present our recommendations for summer 2016 learning. We're really hoping through our recommendations we can help our other schools, including Lincoln, uh, who are experiencing summer learning loss. Uh, the success of summer school is a team effort, and the team of support staff, teachers, and administrators has been clearly focused on developing an approach that maximizes the opportunities to advance every student's learning through the summer program. As we have shared, there's reliable research that indicates if summer learning loss can be stopped over time, that the achievement gap can be narrowed. Tonight we want you to walk away understanding our recommendations in the context of Blueprint Commitment 116E, the learning and fiscal implement implementations of our recommendations, and the timeline for subsequent recommendations. As mentioned, our recommendations are part of Commitment 116E, which is to implement summer school recommendations that maximize opportunities to advance student learning. Here you can see the specific recommendations under 116E that emerged from the months-long work of a committee of teachers and administrators in the 2013-2014 school year. In this slide and the next two, you can see which of these recommendations we implemented for the 2015 Summer Learning Program. And at the October 5th board meeting, we outlined the success of those recommendations being implemented. Additionally, we did send out a survey to the 2015 Summer Learning parents, and of those who responded, 83% responded they were satisfied or very satisfied with their child's experience. Furthermore, we made progress in enrolling a greater percentage of economically at-risk students in summer school that are enrolled in our, then are enrolled in our summer, or then are enrolled in our schools during the regular school year, a key factor in working to close the achievement gap. Finally, we were able to offer students who were already succeeding additional opportunities to grow or put in place learning supports for students aligned with what is available during the school year. We intend to continue to implement all of these recommendations for the 2016 school year. 
Transportation will continue at all levels of general education summer school. ESY, general education, and ELL will continue to share sites at the elementary level. In addition, we will be promoting additional opportunities for students who have an IEP as well as our ELL students at the junior high level. Various support services were implemented at each summer site in 2015. We'll continue to offer services that mirror support students receive during the regular school year. And you will see later in this presentation our plans to expand on the success of Project Lead the Way and Code HS at the junior high level. For 2016, we'll be focusing on other specific steps outlined in Commitment 116E related to the three items you see here. A curriculum team has been assembled under the leadership of Learning Services staff to make sure that our core curriculum in grades K through 8 is aligned to what is being learned during the school year. Here you can see the timeline for that work and the development of the proper course assessments. The bulk of the work is related to realigning and sequencing for summer what is being taught during the year, then training staff on how to most effectively deliver that learning. Related to curriculum team updates, the team continues to work on renaming certain courses as they become realigned and sequenced. In the course offerings, you will notice new titles for K-5 literacy and math courses. We've realigned, resequenced, and are working on renaming the literacy course at the junior high level. We'll be looking to differentiate that course by grade level depending upon enrollment, which has not been done in the past. Additionally, one new course differentiated by grade depending on enrollment will be for students whose qualification for honors math indicates that they would benefit from this course specifically designed to prepare them for the upcoming rigors of honors math. Another new course will be one designed to support students whose qualifications for Algebra 1 indicate they will greatly benefit from a course specifically designed to prepare them for Algebra when they arrive at the high school. Algebra 1 is considered a gateway course and success there is a strong indicator of future college readiness. In 2015, we housed our ELL courses and elementary courses in the same building and this year we are advancing our inclusion of ELL students in general education and using our grant funding creatively to accomplish this. For ELL students who have been in the U.S. less than three years and score within a certain range on the access test, they will enroll in ELL coursework similar to what we've had in the past. For ELL students who don't qualify under these guidelines, we will support them in general education courses, enrolling them in clusters and providing an ELL teacher for every two classes where the students are clustered. We believe this will provide our students with greater exposure to the general education curriculum in the summer with their English first peers provide the second language learning support they need, and enhance collaboration between general education and ELL teachers. ESY, our extended school year program for students with special needs who have this program included in their IEPs, will be reorganized again to continue to create greater inclusion for students and greater continuity with general education summer school. We'll be offering an early childhood option for two hours per day at Ann Reed, this was previously held at other district summer sites. Because of how rapidly children develop at this age, this option is very effective in helping students to not lose any developmental ground over the summer. Also new will be the operational hours of K-12 ESY to match the operational hours of general education summer school. While ESY will still operate four days a week, its beginning and end times will match general education so students are more easily included and so staff can better support one another. In addition to our K-8 alignment work, the ELL and ESY revisions, you can see we are building on much of what we accomplished in 2015. The computer programming course Code HS and Project Lead the Way course were each enrolled to capacity, and we plan to offer new courses in those same sequences for 2016. Likewise, the choral course will be rolled up so kids can continue to um, participate in a summer choral experience, and we're going to offer an ultimate keyboarding class for junior high students that will aim to increase their typing skills and introduce them to the Google environment. Finally, consistent with our revisions to the high school science course sequence, dynamic earth systems will be dropped from summer school. One of the recommendations that is proving challenging to implement is an electronic learner profile that can follow a student from the regular ed school year to summer school and back again to the subsequent school year. 
We, do, we currently do not have an electronic platform that can do everything we are seeking. However, our current work on student growth data is a, affording us a chance to pilot with ECRA a platform at no additional charge. Uh, in, the months, in the coming months, we expect to develop the ability to include course grades when appropriate and text items provided by the year-long teacher and summer school teacher, which can provide more nuanced information related to student goals, strengths, and developments. The full imp implementation of standards-based reporting will play an important role in helping our students year-round in the future. Before we discuss the last and most far-reaching recommendation for 2016, I would like to return to this slide and recommendation from last year, namely that last year the board approved an incremental tuition increase which will continue for the 2016 school year. This increase will continue to keep summer school reasonably priced for our community. As we will present, it will provide, as it was designed to do, the revenue to cover the expenses directly related to teaching and learning in summer school classrooms. The last recommendation related to increasing access to summer learning is that we provide a six-week learning opportunity for K-8 students. To narrow the achievement gap, we believe that a six-week opportunity will meet the needs of many of our learners and, frankly, the needs of many of our families that have both parents or guardians working full-time and are seeking meaningful learning opportunities for their students during the summer. Of the 100 surveys received so far from 2015 summer school parents, 73 responded they would be very likely or likely to enroll their student in a six-week learning option. However, most of those respondents were already enrolled in a six-week option. We hope to have more and more refined survey data for the next board meeting. The course realignments and resequencing we have discussed with you is premised on six, a six-week learning model, although we will be registering students in two three-week sessions, and there's no reason that a student cannot register for a three-week session, either the first or the second. We anticipate, and our budgetary projections are based upon the assumption that a greater proportion of students who are traditionally identified as economically disadvantaged will enroll for that additional three-week session. Of course, we bring this forward based on the board's ongoing support for summer learning and humbly recognizing that the recommendation includes an investment by the Board of Education and the community as a whole. Some assumptions we, we put in place when attempting the budget for this recommendation include the following that our hard work will continue to produce increased enrollments in our standard summer school offerings, that our outreach will continue to result in an increased enrollment of waiver-eligible students, that our second three-week session will not enroll at the same rate, but we estimate half as many students, and that our waiver-eligible students will represent a greater proportion of the enrollments for the second three-week session. Please know, however, that consistent with our belief about the efficacy of summer learning, we will encourage students to attend for all six weeks so they may experience a depth of learning that will last into the new school year. While our projections are really educated guesses, we do have some revenue and expense-related items. First, although raising tuition to the 2017 recommended price would keep our prices reasonable, we think it prudent to keep in place the 2016 recommended tuition. Second, we also think it's reasonable to assess a $25 transportation fee per rider for each three-week session, which comes out to less than $2 per round trip per day. Third, we did have to help cover the costs of some waiver-eligible students attending the Park District's camp LOL. However, the Park District did provide $100 scholarships for each eligible child, and they are exploring altering their scholarship structure so that more of the scholarship money can be applied per student. We will continue to seek alternative external sources of funding this expense as we believe it's a key ingredient to being able to enroll waiver eligible students in summer school. Ultimately, we believe the board's overall investment in a six-week summer school in 2016 will be the same or less than 25 percent more than it totaled for the 2015 program, largely due to the cost sharing possible, transportation fee, and nominal tuition increases. Here you can see what we have planned going forward. Most of our work will relate to strengthening the gains we have already made and making summer learning a more continuous experience for our students in relation to the regular school year. An outstanding recommendation does relate to incentivizing summer learning for our students who would most benefit from it, although we've made strides toward achieving that goal. Because of the necessity of making sure our improvements have been fully implemented, I would not anticipate that we'd be ready for a program evaluation until the 2017-2018 school year, which we would look back at students who had enrolled in summer learning over the previous three summers serving as our primary experimental group. 
please know that everyone involved with this blueprint commitment has been passionate about it and grateful for the board's ongoing support. I'm now glad to take your questions. Okay. Um, after Pat's presentation and Kevin's presentation, it begs the question of year-round school. Mm. Is that on one of our conversations for anything coming up? We haven't specifically worded it in that way, uh, but alternative. As I don't know whatever you want to call it. we have looked at how we, uh, for exa Extent. example, the extension of an elementary program from three weeks to six weeks. Uh, as we look at the summer not being, as Mrs. Romberg, I think, was saying, is just this thing where people go because they're behind or an extra thing. It's a part of our instructional program. In some ways, you could argue that that's what we're doing right now, is providing schooling year-round. Not a year-round calendar, certainly not a required component during the summer, but providing more opportunities for instruction throughout the year and shorter breaks then. So as we've seen an increase in the number of students being enrolled, um, you know, I, I would I would say that's kind of an opportunity we're already presenting. Um, but if that's something the board eventually would like to ask us to look at, we would do that. Do any of the benchmark schools from our, the consortium do that? I'm no. just curious. I mean, we're no longer agrarian, no. and I'm just it's a you know it's a leftover right. vestige of. Something. Yeah, I'll remind you again that one of our blueprint commitments is looking at the school day of the school year. Uh, now, I can't say that the committee has gone to that level, um, but uh, we are certainly looking at, from exactly what you said, uh, times and needs to change, so we have to look at how the school day and school year can support learning today. Okay. Thank you, Kevin. Aren't you glad you weren't on the hot seat for that one? Perfect. Perfect. <laughs> Thought about passing it to him, a leadership <laughs> opportunity for you. Thanks for your report. I have a couple questions. Um, so I had noted in the, um, and I'm working from the document that is provided as background. So um, I had noted that I really liked the idea of the uh, PI um, plus, uh, not the PI plus, the honors math. Mm -hmm. I think that's, it's interesting. I've, I know many students who have been in a situation of going in and because math is such a building block, um, it, it seems like that's a really smart area to um, to focus on. Um, I'm wondering, it seemed as if there were fewer, um, there's a, I, I like it that there's a lot of math and that there's um, good courses for the, um, like the STEM and looking at the Project Lead the Way. Um, just looking at, for example, that presentation that we had before mm -hmm. with the Lincoln students where we saw that the summer reading slide was significant um, do you are you looking at that it, it, I, and I don't know if that's a, a trend for many junior highs but you know just looking at this junior high list here there is the read write run mm -hmm. but um, fewer and the Shakespeare so that's two mm -hmm. uh, but f it seemed fewer on the um, English language arts side it may look like that on the on the report, but um, in terms of our um, literacy skills class, um, that will be broken out by grade level. Okay. So it may look like okay. the number has decreased here, but we consolidated those uh, course descriptions uh, because essentially they, the course descriptions are the same with that, just with the exception of the grade level. So like, for example, with this read, write, run, six through eight, it would be three different classes, and so that would be more... Now he's referring to the essential literacy skills. Essential literacy skills is the one that I'm referring to, yes. Okay. Okay. It just was something that in looking at some of, oh, I see it. I see it. Okay. In the, in the past, uh, we have run a, a sixth grade read, write, and run class, uh -huh. and then we've done a combined seventh and eighth, uh -huh. um, just based on the enrollment numbers for each grade level. So. Okay. It, just, it was just a question that I had just mm -hmm. given that, um, that presentation, but I had written it down actually even beforehand. Um, okay, a couple other questions. Um, looking at more detail in your budget, I have a couple questions about the transportation fee. That's new, correct? Correct. And if you are a um, student who is um, in need of economic support, that would not be charged, correct? Correct. Okay, so the, the $25 fee would be just for um, individuals who elect the transportation that are not in that category. Correct. So, um, and I, I think that's a good idea. Um, originally, when we thought about the transportation, it was proposed to remove a barrier, barrier specifically for 
students who were econ economically disadvantaged. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. So um, at when you look at the budgets a little bit more, it is um, that does seem to be the area where we collecting the fee will cover a portion of it. But it is an area where it's you know for example I I, I can't I can't find that page but um, I think there was a seven thousand dollar contribution and a forty seven thousand dollar cost and I don't know which grade level I was looking at with that but it's it that's you're where at the elementary six week ex estimate okay Correct. okay so that's where it seems like we are not um, covering quite covering what our costs are you know and so there's this question of you don't want to deter those students because you want to encourage all students to come in you don't want to deter them with too much right. but at the same time you know um, to not cover the costs here we have so many other programs and you know for example when you compare with the um, special ed you know that's all you know those costs can't be made up you know and right. we want to offer those services or looking at in the in your presentation that you did about and you didn't it's not really referenced in the presentation but looking at the additional detail on English language learners again areas where you know there's just you know there's a subsidy that that we'll be putting through um, you yet your recommendation was to keep it at just a ten dollar increase and not cover a, a further amount of the costs either through that fee or through the transportation. Right. Why? Especially given that we are a lot lower than, you know, surrounding area, and you don't give a whole lot of detail as to what that is. Um, you know, would another $5 fee, a $5 addition to the tuition, would that cover our costs or 10? Would that, would that cover our costs? You know, I, I'm going to step in here for you, Kevin. I think yeah. we, we could go back to, for our next meeting, some of the recommendation that we brought forward last year regarding the incremental increases yeah. in fees and the rationale behind it. Uh, I don't think we had brought forward at that time the transportation increase. Yes, no. Um, and, and so that's through looking at ways to, one, like you said, um, try to offset some of the costs, uh, but also not create a barrier. Right. But I think there has to be a little bit of a kind of a mind shift in thinking about summer school here and that this is an investment that we're making in the learning for our students. And so with that comes a cost. And you know, we, there, there's cost to everything that we do from uh, August through June as well. So I think that's why you know, this is just trying to, we, we charge fees for courses during the regular school year. So there's some fees associated with this too. Um, and so this, that's really kind of the mindset is that uh, keep the fees at a reasonable price to try to encourage family. And then we have a number of families also, you know, that may not qualify for free and reduced lunch, but it's difficult to, to, to get ends to meet. And so we don't want uh, a cost to be a barrier for students. So I, I think you kind of have to look at an offset here, but we can be prepared to go back to the recommendation. I will note there is one change uh, in the recommendation, um, different than what was recommended last year, and that's the cost for the driver's education program. Yeah. I think we didn't incre recommend an increase from to 265 or 275, but now we've said 300 right. after with the process we went through with the waiver request from the state. So that'll be consistent with what we'll be charging. Uh, the board has already approved for next year at 300. So I mean that is one change where we've again looked at costs. Driver's Ed's one of the programs though that has you know you stay it stays close to its costs. So right. uh, again, I guess. What I'm trying to say is that we see this as an investment in our kids' learning, and with that comes some costs. So um, we're, we're looking at fees that uh, can help offset some of the costs, and the rest of it being an investment in their learning. Um, a couple questions. Um, thank you so much for your report. The, um, are there a lot of participants on the buses? Is that, is that a pretty popular situation? We, we did. We had over 1,100 students uh, utilize the, the bus system. Okay, and I don't have a perspective. Summer. There's no bus riding around with three kids on it, right? The buses no, are no, okay, they're, perfect. Yeah, somewhere so, between 35 and 40. And I guess the way I look at it, of course you like to recover your costs, um, but I guess piggybacking with Dan said, there are so many programming things that aren't revenue neutral, and as a family, you look and you have two or three kids, and you're thinking there's soccer, there's softball, there's this. What I don't want to do, don't give up this, you know, don't, don't be giving this up. So um, I guess I'm supportive of always looking, of course, um, but if there's, a, if there's a way we can keep it kind of affordable, um, we do some things that are very unique in our district. We uh, bus parochial schools, uh, students, many districts don't. Those are all our kids, and it's a big expense. So I'm all about, if it's not going to be revenue neutral, um, know it. But to Kristen's point, know what your investment is. Know what your um, know that know that it's going to be this kind of a cost. And I had one other. Um, 
think that was it. Perfect. Thanks I'm so go, much. I'm gonna, uh, Susan was raising her hand, so I'm going to go with Susan and then you. Is that okay? Yeah. Okay. And this one's for you again. Um, with the different programs that we're doing, are there any grants available that we should be really digging into? Uh, Kevin, you referred to some, if you want to speak to that. And then I think there's always, uh, before you answer that. I don't have any, any specific that I know of. I know that yeah. Kane's been working on that. So, so we can have uh, that some right. report back. But okay. that's always an avenue where I think we have to be a little bit, probably a little bit more aggra aggressive. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. Much of the funding and a lot of the grants to support programs like this, uh, we don't qualify for because of the level of the free and reduced lunch we have compared to their target. Uh, recipients, but uh, I think it's in our interest on, on not only this but other things to really look at what alternate funding sources might be available for us. Thank you. In addition, the state, and this is just test, because of the state non payment to social service agencies, there's a huge demand on private grants now that foundations are reporting that they're receiving double and triple the number of applications. So, of course. Uh. <laughs> Okay, so my colleagues have asked a lot of my questions already, but I am very intrigued with the electronic learner profile. So you're calling this a pilot platform, so I'd like to hear more about um, are we piloting it for future use in um, summer school, or are we piloting it for future use throughout the year with all students? Like what, what uh, do we have some more on that? I, I believe both. Um, again, this is a, an area that uh, that Kane's been doing some research in, and I think um, you know when when he's back here and, and we're back here in two weeks, that'd probably be a one of the summer school recommendations that came from the committee the last time was um, concern about you know if you if a student moves from say third grade to fourth grade, that group of teachers is down the hall. There's procedures that they have in place for communication about students' progress. When a student leaves a home school to go to our summer school program, how do we ensure that we have a learner profile that supports the teacher during the summer school. So this initially starts with a recommendation for something for expanded use at summer school, but it doesn't mean it has to be limited. And we can talk a little bit more about that, what that looks like next time. Great, thanks. Can, if I could add just one thing that um, they're working into the system is like a dialogue box that would allow them to put notes about the learner um, so that, as, as Dan was mentioning, you go from one school to a next, that kind of information could be passed on as to what the school is or the <laughs> teacher is doing with the student. That's been successful. Thank you. I'm sorry. Uh, I'm sorry. I did. I didn't write my question down, but I had my computer open to to remember, and then I didn't remember. Um, the extended school year it always runs a little bit of a loss. I feel, and maybe this is a, a question that I can ask uh, in two weeks again. But the, um, the projection for next year is quarter million dollar loss. I thought it was, is that growing or is that, I, I didn't go back and look at the last year. Well, I'd ask Christine or Lisa if they can speak to that. These and are certain not, we can talk about yeah. it in a couple of weeks. But well, I, I just, yeah, I, we can look I, at I don't know what I do about it. It is what it is. But that's all a more reason that we, right. pardon me? Mandated by law. Exactly. Mm -hmm. But that's all the more reason I think we always do better when we understand all of our costs and, and there's not much we can do about that. So I, I believe again when we look at our achievement gaps and, and one of those is is areas where you know our, our students um, who have IEPs I think um, uh, you know we're trying to expand mm -hmm. uh, how many of those students are participating in, in summer learning and so we're gonna um, you know begin as the report you know stated it um, working to get them in some of our general education <laughs> summer areas as well. We began to, to do that a little bit more this past summer but I think we want to expand on that even more. So if they don't qualify for ESY, right. that they can be included within that um, that general education classroom. Uh, right. Christine, what do you want to add? Well. Um, I just wanted to add that we are seeing it as we're seeing an increase in the number of students who are qualifying for ESY. Got it. So we're not necessarily our projected state reimbursement's not going up, but we're we're spending it because Correct. we need to spend it, and it's mandated, and it's the right thing to do. But um, the revenues aren't meeting with that, so that so correct. the the gap is wider. So. That's correct. Okay, thank you. And you know, again, just to say, I, I I think without a question, we're all looking at supporting the great work of the summer school and in including additional people and increasing the um, additional kids, especially those kids who are suffering the summer um, slide or the summer reading loss or whatever, if it's math or reading. Um, I did want to ask, you, you mentioned something about the Camp LOL and um, 
that it seems to me is one of our great additions the mm -hmm. you know the wraparound program I think in the past you have been successful in getting some grant support for that haven't you because I, I think that those grants like we said they are so successful from the park district they That's have an I internal thought. grant process that okay. I think they're and they're looking at different ways to actually apply that that would be even more beneficial to our students uh, uh, who require such support right yeah, so just I, I know that that we have been actually successful and just to, to add another voice I think that that those grants if we can find them and I agree we don't qualify for all of them But, right, but to the extent that we can then it makes it not get more possible there. for us to support additional things So yeah, awesome Thanks Kevin, and we'll be back for further discussion and so answer much. some of the questions that you've raised uh, next week and, and hope for action appreciate your work on this Kevin uh, also this evening uh, what we have is the first report uh, to the Board of Education uh, we are due for uh, a renewal or consideration for a renewal of our contract uh, for our bridge alternative program. Uh, and uh, so tonight what we'd like to do is present for your first reading. Uh, you have a copy of the, uh, the proposed contract, uh, which is really a rollover uh, of the previous contract, just slightly updated. But then also uh, an update on the work uh, of, of the bridge and what's going on at the school. Uh, so this evening we have to update the Board of Education our Assistant Superintendent for Student Services, Dr. Christine Igo, Director of Student, Ser Student Services, Lisa Exegas, and the Principal of the Bridge, uh, Naperville Bridge School, Eileen Roberts. And I'll turn it over to Christine to get us started uh, with information about the bridge. Good evening and thank you for the opportunity to speak with you about the Naperville Bridge. Eileen Roberts, the principal of the bridge, and Lisa Exegas, the director of student services, are joining me this evening to provide you with an update on the services within the program and make recommendations for the future. The Naperville Bridge is connected to two of our strategic blueprints, the multi-level system of support, which ensures that we have academic and behavior supports in place for our students, and the review of our special education service delivery model. Meeting the needs of our, each of our learners requires us to provide services that go beyond those that are offered within our traditional teaching and learning environment. The Alternative Learning Opportunities Program, or ALOP, provides three different pathways with varying supports and services to students who need an alternative learning environment in order to obtain the learning outcomes that have been established by the district. The Academy provides a school within a school model for our general education sophomore and junior students who struggle to meet academic expectations during their freshman year. Students are provided the District 203 core curriculum within a cohort setting. Ombudsman offers credit recovery within a blended learning environment over the course of a shortened school day. Students engage in self-paced online courses with the additional support of certified teachers to help navigate any barriers that may arise. These services are offered both on-site and off-site and focus on our junior and senior level students. The Naperville Bridge, the focus of our presentation this evening, provides a small off-site learning community designed to meet the individual needs of our students who are at risk for not meeting the learning and behavioral standards established by the district and the state. The Naperville Bridge was established in August of 2009 through a collaborative partnership with Abraxas Youth and Family Services. The program was designed around four core components, academics, pro-social behavior modification, social skill acquisition, and reintegration transition services to the home school or post-secondary life. The bridge encompasses two programs within one, an ALOP program for general education students and a private therapeutic day school for special education students. 30 general education students may be referred either through their home high school's problem solving team or through the disciplinary process for ALOP services. A success plan is written for each student enrolled, which outlines the learning and behavioral goals established by the school team, as well as the services and supports the student needs to meet those outcomes. 20 special education students may be referred through the Individualized Educational Planning, or IEP team, for the therapeutic private day school services. It is important to note students must have an eligibility of an emotional disturbance or other health impairment in order to be considered for this placement. 
The Individualized Education Plan, or IEP, outlines the learning and behavioral goals, as well as the services and supports the student needs to meet these outcomes. In order to monitor the overall success of the bridge program, the district has established the success indicators noted. These indicators help guide the continuous improvement process to establish the yearly goals for the program. Moving forward, we will review if these indicators continue to be appropriate. For instance, the graduation indicator is difficult to reach given the small number of students who are eligible for graduation each year. If only 18 students are eligible for graduation, meaning they're in their fourth year of high school, the only way to meet this goal is for 100% of students to graduate, which would exceed the district's current graduation rate of 97%. The bridge provides alternative learning opportunities for 50 District 203 students. On this graph, the blue bar represents the total students served in both programs. The red represents the total students receiving special education services. The gray represents students receiving ALOP services. And the yellow represents the number of students out of the total served that year that were placed in lieu of expulsion. The staff at the bridge and the home school establish ongoing communication and collaboration to ensure student success and to monitor when a transition back to their home school would be appropriate. As you can see from this graph, the bridge often serves more than 50 students in a given year, and this is due to the flexibility of the program and students successfully transitioning or graduating throughout the school year. In order to meet the individualized needs of the students, the bridge is staffed to ensure a low student to teacher ratio, which allows the staff to provide for intensive social and emotional support and address the unique needs of our students. The collaboration between the bridge staff and District 203 staff is what makes the bridge different from other therapeutic day schools and ALOP services available. The student services teams from each high school are actively involved with the students, regularly spending time at the bridge to ensure students feel connected to their home high school. As mentioned earlier, academics is one of the core components of the program and students receive the District 203 curriculum with accommodations and modifications for the individual needs of the students. There is also a strong collaboration between the bridge and district staff around implementing the District 203 core curriculum. Staff at the bridge utilize the curriculum maps, resources, and professional learning opportunities available for District 203 teachers. In addition, beginning this school year, each teacher from the bridge is paired with a content area specialist from one of our high schools to increase the consistency and implementation of the curriculum. One excellent example of the collaboration that occurs between the bridge and District 203 staff can be seen with the implementation of the DLI initiative this school year. The bridge teachers participated in the two-day intensive professional learning that occurred this summer, as well as the infrastructure at the bridge was upgraded by our IT staff to meet the new demands of the devices. This allows for continuity of instruction as the students transition between the bridge and their home school. One of our success indicators is a GPA that is greater than 2.75. This graph indicates the average GPA per semester for all students, both ALOP and special education, enrolled at the bridge. The average GPA does not meet the benchmark in the success indicators. However, it does indicate students are showing competency towards the learning outcomes established within our core curriculum. While students are not meeting the success indicator, we are seeing growth related to students' GPA. This table shows the average GPA of students in the last semester of their home school compared to the average GPA of students in their first semester at the bridge. After one semester at the bridge, students see an average increase of one point in their semester GPA, which brings their average GPA within that range for our success indicator. This graph shows the average credits earned in their last semester at their home school compared to the credits earned in their first semester at the bridge. We see on average students are earning one full additional credit, which is the equivalent of passing two additional classes than they did the previous semester. The increase in credits increases their likelihood of graduating within four years. Meeting the social emotional needs of the students is another core component of the program which is provided through the therapeutic supports infused throughout the school day. Students participate daily in character education groups which focuses on teaching the social emotional competencies necessary to meet the goals. Teachers, social worker, and intervention specialists collaborate in order to build, reinforce, and promote the use of self-management and self-regulation strategies. Art therapy is an additional support that provides students the opportunity to explore their emotions in a non-threatening environment while learning coping strategies to generalize across the environments. Students at the bridge have the opportunity to participate in the Chicago Area Alternative Education League 
or CALE, which allows students to engage in competitive sports and activities. These opportunities allow students to practice and generalize the pro-social skills they are developing within their daily groups. Individual and group counseling is provided to students based upon their individual needs. Students in crisis also access these services. Substance abuse counseling is another service that has been added based upon student need. Students that are placed at the bridge due to violation of discipline policy related to drug and alcohol are recommended to participate in these counseling services. Other students are offered these services based upon individual needs. Service learning projects provide students the opportunity to be, to be self-directed learners. Students investigate, develop, and implement the service projects that are most meaningful to them in their community. In order for students to benefit from the services available at the bridge, we need to be sure they are attending school on a consistent basis. Although we have not met the success indicator of a 90% attendance rate, we have increased services in this area in an effort to better support students. Research indicates when students feel a personal connection to school, they are more likely to attend. So the bridge has implemented the following procedure. When a student is absent for more than one day, the case manager will make a phone call to the student to check in and remind them they were missed. If the student misses more than three days, the guidance counselor will make a home visit and then transport the student to school. If this procedure is unsuccessful, the truancy services through the DuPage Regional Office of Education are contacted for additional supports. Another core component of the program is the successful transition back to the homeschools or post-secondary life. The average length of time a student is enrolled full-time at the bridge is two and a half semesters. The students are either achieve the graduation requirements or have met the requirements to begin the transition back to their homeschool. A systematic reintegration plan is developed for students, which usually incorporates one or two classes at the homeschool to help ensure success. As students are successful with those classes, additional classes are added until a student reaches full-time status at their home school. This slide represents the number of graduates for all students, ALOP and special education, enrolled at the bridge, as well as their post-secondary plans. As we mentioned earlier, a graduation rate of 98% is one of the, of the success indicators for the program. However, given the small number of students eligible for graduation, each year, it is more beneficial to review data in terms of the number of students who graduated and their post-secondary goals. We are happy to report a de decreasing trend over the last three years in the number of students who are unable to meet the graduation requirements. In 2014-15, only two students exited the program without receiving a diploma. This slide breaks the graduates from each year into three groups. Students who graduated in four years are represented in red. Those who graduated in less than four years are represented by the blue, and those that graduated in more than four years are represented by the gray. Reviewing data as it relates to the length of time to graduate allows us to better understand if our program is providing the support students need to graduate with their class. We can celebrate that a majority of our students are graduating in four years, with some even graduating a semester early, and only a few needing additional time to meet the requirements. This program is funded by two sources of state revenue. The ALAP program is based upon average daily attendance and the general state aid being funded at the foundational level. And the state reimburses for special education services that exceed two times per our district cap two times the district per capita. The tables on the slide represent the cost per student with and without student state reimbursement. Moving forward, we are recommending a two-year contract with the option to renew for a third year. This, this remains consistent with our past contracts in that it will continue to support 30 ALOP students and 20 special education students with the District 203 curriculum and resources and transportation. The contract calls for an increase of 3% for the first two years, and if the third year is evoked, a 2% increase for our ALAP services. Special education seats are paid at the rate established by the Illinois Purchase Review Board, and those rates are reviewed yearly. As we reflect on the past three years, there are many points of pride for the Bridge Program. 52 students have earned their high school diploma. Students are gaining skills needed to transition to post-secondary life or, home, or their home school in only two and a half semesters. All students are actively engaged in the DLI initiative, even if they are not attending their home schools. And collaboration among Bridge and District 203 staff is strong and continues to improve. And finally, students' GPAs do increase when they, during their first semester at the Bridge. Our recommendations to the board are as follows. 
first we are rec rec recommending to renew our contract for two years and we are focusing on two instead of three due to the ongoing work with the multi-level systems of support and special education service delivery blueprints. Second, we are recommending we continue to increase the rigor of the academic courses and to build proactive behavior systems that support our students. Finally, we are recommending that we engage bridge staff and professional learning to increase non-traditional instructional strategies within their classrooms and implement the district balanced assessment system, which includes district benchmark assessments and common final exams. Thank you for the opportunity to share our program with you this evening. We are happy to answer any questions that you may have. Thank you very much. I apologize for having to leave. I have a scratchy throat. Does anybody have any questions? Huh? No, you're shocked. I do. <laughs> um, so when our students graduate, they get a Naperville 203 diploma. Does it say bridge or anything alternate? Like, what is it saying? I don't think I've ever seen one. Sure. For our students that meet the requirements for our, the District 203, they do receive a District 203 diploma. Okay. Um, we do have some students who meet um, the state requirements and receive a bridge diploma, in which case it does say a Naperville bridge. Okay, so that would, that would be more like a GED? No, it's a high school diploma. Okay. Uh, it just doesn't have the District 203 requirements. It just requires the state requirements for graduation. So they got all the minimums for the correct. state. Correct. Our requirements not, are, not are our stronger extra, than whatever. the okay. state. That is correct. Um, so if you look at your map, and it shows us um, on page 7 the bridge enrollment that you know 57 students serve, how full is your program? Because I know it kind of ebbs and flows. Can you share that a little bit? Sure. Um, currently, hold on, I have those numbers. Sorry. <laughs> no, that's okay. Um, currently, we have 18 ALAP students placed and 16 special education students. It's not uncommon for us to see a, a, sl uh, a lower um, attendance rate in the fall with an increase um, in the spring. Okay. And then the students, you know, they come to you kind of behind in credits, and your job is to, you know, help them get get to that final graduation so when they're past when you know it's, there was another chart that showed you know like the number that took more than four years mm -hmm. um, how long can they stay to re you know what is that is it a fifth year or a sixth year is it until the day before their 22nd birthday I mean what is it what does that look like it somewhat depends okay um, <laughs> um, if they're a special ed student they would have the option to stay until their 22nd birthday if we that was what was uh, appropriate um, and then depending on where that student is, we would always encourage our students to stay and participate um, so that they can earn that diploma. Sure, and for our ALEP students or non-special education students, um, if they can earn all the credits required to receive a diploma before they turn 21, they're allowed to, to remain until they do so. Okay, thank you. Sure. Mm -hmm. Jackie, did you have a question? Oh. Okay. Um, I, I, I was it. just I, exactly. So what I was think what I was thinking about, just so the community knows that's listening or might listen later, we have to hire these teachers. And you went through it's it's not a uh, it's a principal for special education teachers. Uh, you know they're busy people. They're busy people with what they're doing. Um, and as Susan pointed out, it eb ebbs and flows. You can't, you're not always gonna have 50 students in the program, um, but you need these, you, you need a skeleton crew because sometimes you're gonna have 37 and then other times you're gonna have 57. Um, but does 50 sound like the right amount, I guess to the district is the question. Does that still, the 30-20 split still, it was right three years ago, it was right when we started. Does that still seem like the right? Yeah, I, I think it does. I, I mean, okay. You look at the enrollment now and that 57 that was on there, that's, not 57 at one time. Right, so right, right. 50, I think still 50 is appropriate. Great, thanks. Kristen? Well, I am the um, Naperville Bridge adopt a school member this year, so it was a pleasure to get to go out there a couple months ago and see sort of firsthand the supports that, the unique supports, I would say, that you offer for students. And I noticed that you put in the art therapy program, and I, I got to see a little bit of that, and I think that's a, a very unique support that it seems to be effective. Um, I have a question for you about your data that you have in terms of your graduates and their their intentions, their college-bound intentions or career-bound intentions. Do you keep any kind of, um, you know, I know in District 203 we do a survey of our graduates when they're done and say, you know, did you know, are you in are you in college? Do you keep data as to, you know, for the ones who are college bound, do they get into college? Do they succeed in college? Um, have the tools that they've learned at the bridge help them to be successful? 
I'm just wondering if you have sure. sort of that long-term look. Sure. We don't necessarily have it called out by the students that attend the bridge. So they would receive the survey just like any other graduate of District 203. So we would have that information within there, but we wouldn't necessarily have it specific to a student who attended the bridge or did not attend the bridge. Certainly something we can investigate. Donna? So my question, first, thanks for all your data and all the input. And my question is um, in relation to your en enrollment slide. So um, you have the total students, you have special ed, you have ALAP students, and then we have in lieu of students. Are the in lieu of the students who are placed there in lieu of um, expulsion part of the ALAP? It depends. Okay. Um, I mean, if they're not special, the special ed. Yes. Okay. So that, that, like for 12, 13, there's 16 students, right? Right. So some of them may be in the special education, some of them may be in the ALAP side. That six. So that's why you're, or, like, the they're not added into your total. Right? Correct. Okay. You should see the special ed students and the ones. ALAP students okay. equal the total, total. number. Okay. And of that total number, 16 of them were placed in lieu of. Oh, okay. And some of them have IEPs and some of them do not. Right. I understand that. Okay. okay. And then, um, but all of the students at the bridge are from 203, correct? That's correct. correct. Okay. And so I guess as we look at the contract and as um, to follow up with Jackie's question about the numbers, it would be great if we had like average attendance to look at, at least some kind of data oh, on average sure, attendance. Sure, sure. Absolutely. We actually have that data. Oh, We'd be great. happy to supply that with you, for you. And uh, I got to look at my notes. I think that was it. I think I got them all in. <laughs> Does anybody else have any questions in the meantime? Did you have any other questions, Tana? I don't. Nope. nope. All right. Thank you very much for your right. time. Thank you for your Thank you. report. Thank you very much. Okay. We'll move to section 803, and we'll do our little policy work. And I regret that Dr. Osborne's not here today. And then we'll uh, help of staff walk you through. Fortunately, as you look at these, uh, many of these are subtle changes of what we're talking about this evening, uh, but we'll go through policy by policy. 630 is probably the most significant change, and really it's a press recommendation uh, that really uh, kind of thinks about basic school principles and, and organizations of schools. So uh, you see some pretty significant language change in there, but this comes uh, to us from press and also some additional cross-references. How do you want us to take questions? Do you want us to go individually yeah, each time, with questions? Each time, please. Yep, each okay. policy. Okay. And does anybody have any questions on 6.30? Oh. I do not. No. no? <laughs> okay. Next. All right, 665, uh, student social and emotional development. Um, only changes there uh, is uh, uh, an additional cross-reference. Any questions? Okay. 6120, same thing, deals with the education of children with disabilities and their statutory cross-reference update that's provided. Questions? Okay. 6.140 yeah, is, totally. uh, is a new policy, uh, and it, uh, it's new from press, uh, and, and it uh, provides guidance and information aligned with the McKinley-Vento Act uh, regarding our education of homeless children in our district. Questions? Okay. 6.170 uh, is revises a section to include the term equity instead of equivalency uh, regarding Title I funding. You also see some additional uh, cleanup of language regarding cross-references uh, that are provided for the policy. Kristen. I do have a question on that one. Um, it, and it's just a question about the parent comp compact. Um, and I know that that's, a not, that's not a new policy. My question was, do we provide the parent compact for all students and parents in a Title I school or just for specific students who are receiving services in quotes? Uh, Dr. Astor is going to respond to that for you. I'm working on a microphone. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah, yeah we <laughs> I've got one that batteries out, so we're working on it. Uh, so the question is, just to make sure I heard it as I was playing with my mic microphone, um, that uh, do we provide the, the parent compact for all students? At a Title I school, or is it just specific students, you know, that are okay. receiving services? So each school has a, um, a, a, a compact okay. um, that is actually for the entire school. And with that compact, that requires the school to share what their Title I plans are and to involve parents in the process. 
but then the individual students receiving services because we are a targeted assistance program instead of school-wide those students actually sign individual agreements it's the student the parent and the school and we keep all of those on record to track our numbers so the title one students that are getting specific service would have like a signed compact but they would provide notice to the rest of the parents or they, it would just be somewhere in the school they provide notice to the rest of the parents so okay. basically um, most of our schools do it through a home and school meeting okay. or fscp um and uh you know they they announce it that way we're okay. required to publicize those meetings and to um uh, make sure that we collect the information from them okay. thank you anyone else Okay, policy 6200, uh, formerly 6200, our recommendation is to uh, change it to 6202, reserve 600, or pardon me, 6200 for future press updates. Uh, this is a uh, district policy, not a press recommendation. So no change to the policy itself, just the title and the number of the policy. Questions? All right. 6214, uh, it re renumbers it as section 6212, dealing with musical instruments slight change by uh, a, a reference to the Board of Education, uh, to the board, uh, and, and just strike some, some language. I have a question on that one. Susan. Um, I happen to know that we rented a bass trombone from school, <laughs> and it's not listed. So is there some way to, I mean, there are some specialty instruments that, you know, on clunes and all these other things that we do get from time to time that kids rent or whatever, and I just, you know, all others not, not yeah, specified we'll, uh, by name or yeah, something, we'll something like that. Yeah, we'll check on that and uh, okay. see if there's others that need to be specifically listed or some of that more general language like okay. and, and Thank you. others Anyone potentially. Else? Okay, moving on. Okay, 6230 is one of the other policies that uh, has a little bit of cleanup, uh, change in title, uh, and then also um, some press recommendations uh, that aligns with state statute and Illinois State Board of Education rules. Kristen. Manage the district library media program to comply with state law and the board of education rule. Where did the number with the number two where there? Where do the following standards come from? This one through six. They're from statute. They're also statute. Yes. Okay. And they're all. If you read them, the statute is much longer, so it's a simplified ver okay. version focusing on the, the main points. Okay. I just wasn't sure because I, it, it just seemed like those were separate from the state law. So I got it. Thank you. Donna and Jackie, did you have your hand raised? No. Oh, Jackie. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, the added verbiage and students in all grades served have equitable access to library media services. Um, would that be Wi-Fi? I mean, what, what's the library anymore, right? It, it could be any of that. And I think this this whole uh, statute, you could say, you know, what does it all mean today? Right. Um, but it's basically, that's actually a, a, a long paragraph that has several things. And it's, it's basically all the resources that are available within the library media, media center. But then the statute also extends that if you don't offer an actual physical facility, um, that any resources or materials um, that are in the classrooms that are part of the library media collection. Okay. So it's not something, I, I understand it. It's yeah. more global. Got it. So everybody has to have it. Got it. Anybody else? Susan? Okay, we can move on. Policy 6250, uh, community resource persons and volunteers. Uh, these revisions include more specific criteria for the usage of uh, resource people and volunteers in our schools. Um, questions? Anybody? Um, yeah. Kristen. Um, I was just surprised to see, um, of course, such a great um, you know, policy, you know, we have so many wonderful volunteers. I was surprised to see that the only thing it mentions for volunteer coaches was reporting hazing and that it only references volunteer coaches. At the very bottom, that's a difference from the previous policy, I believe. <coughs> you know, the sex offender? Well, it, the sex offender was in there, but right. the part about the duty of that person, of the volunteer coach, to comply with their requirement to report hazing, I just, it just sort of seemed strange that that was the only duty that it was mentioned, and that it only mentions volunteer coaches and not any other volunteers. 
Right. Uh, I'll speak to, to Kate about that. We'll come back with a little bit more information on that. But uh, what I would expect that this would mean is that a volunteer coach is somebody who's going to be an ongoing, regular uh, relationship and supervisory responsibilities with kids and, and, and paid coaches. Mm -hmm. uh, the other community resources and volunteers tend to be those that are coming in and uh, coming in for a episodic uh, right. visit to the school. Uh, so we would say somebody in, in a coaching type position would be more uh, more likely to fall under our complete policy. Which I get, but I'm questioning: Do they also then have a duty since they are going to be there more to do, like if there was a suspected situation with a child of like you know child abuse or would well, they, that's what that's it, what uh, policy just, 590 co covers 590 covers but abuse it says specifically to report hazing it, i mean it doesn't say you know what i'm saying like i i, I get it that it's sure, we'll, we'll check on why that's yeah. specifically like that okay mm -hmm. thank you anybody else Okay, uh, 6260 identifies uh, curriculum objection forms as a popular avenue for curriculum complaints. This policy is about complaints regarding curriculum. Questions? Kristen? It's just a, 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 a reference. You, you eliminate the uniform grievance, but we still link to the uniform grievance in the bottom. Mm -hmm. Have we, do we continue to have that policy and we've just taken the wording out for yeah, it? Yeah, the, the process would be that the, it would, you would begin with the, the curriculum objection form process and then if you felt that there was not satisfaction there, that would lead you to the uniform So grievance. that's why it links mm -hmm. to the uniform grievance, okay. And graduation requirements. And 6300 uh, is statutory references uh, updated. Uh, specifically revises reference to Prairie State exam that used to be administered now, uh, more uh, open-ended language formal assessment regarding uh, students' readiness for college and career. Uh, additional uh, legal references and cross-references are also provided. Questions? Kristen? Sorry, I keep having all these questions, but um, I was questioning about the civics. So yeah, I know that's a new one. In the, in the press that uh, right now they don't have an update, there's yeah. uh, legislation potentially considering Passed. delaying that, but there's also legislation yes. being considered delaying the Saw. implementation. Press is waiting to see how that, and then we will we yeah. will have to update this again at a future date. Do we ever consider saying as per state statute so that we don't have to um, keep on going back to, or, or, you know, I just wondered, or other courses mandated by state law, just because it is a question mark that they, you know, they do go, go in quite often, it seems like, and, and you know, mandate particular things. We'll see what press recommends. Okay, that. I just wondered. Any other questions? I have one. Susan. So, th so that last um, policy is kind of my favorite because it has the veterans of World War II or the Korean conflict. And I'm just curious, like, is it limited to that? Because, I mean, a World War II vet would be, you know, exceedingly unexpected in our schools, but we do have other people that have left schools that are younger. Um, it, it, why is it, you know, why are they grandfathered in and others aren't was my question. Let's do some research on that. Okay, thank you. I think it's because they were recruiting kids or some kids were getting out of high school to get in the military and so this was to help them get their degree. Right, but the World War II vets have almost, you know, they're getting up there. <laughs> well, right. Is that I, what you're I mean, saying? I, yeah. I understand what you're saying. I think this yeah. essentially not, just represents a gesture right. for the service it's provided. Right. Is and, it just and for I, this group? Now is this right. right. Exactly. Yes. So I, why it's limited to this, I don't know. Right. Okay. Anything else? All right. Let's move on to discussion with action. Yes. Okay, so, uh, several of these policies in, uh, in item 9.01 out of section 5 have been discussed uh, at several meetings. You'll note that there's one, 590, uh, that we're still working on some language as, as was recommended at our last board meeting. It was brought up by uh, one of our student ambassadors. Uh, but, but the others, uh, any questions that you have that we can respond to, uh, we'll be ready for action. Didn't we have a change to 5300, or we're, we're, we were going to look at wording on 5300 to be consistent with uh, 320? Or am I, does anybody else remember this? I don't. Um, <coughs> let me see here. Um, let me check my notes. Uh, I think you're thinking of a different policy that's not in there. Maybe. Oh, okay. No, that's not that bad. 5300, and we want it to be like 5320. And 5320 is some Support wording. Support staff evaluation.
it wasn't my comment, it was somebody else's, and I just made a note, but now I'm not understanding my, uh, each employee shall be evaluated. I have a question while you're looking that up. How close are we to baking it all the way through all the policies? We have to, a little bit more of uh, Section 6 that I have scheduled for January, and then we'll do Section 7 uh, beginning in the April. Fun so by the end of this school year, we should have an up-to-date manual. And then do we start over again? <laughs> uh, we have a process in place and that will uh, prevent us from getting to the point where we have to go through where we can update periodically as new press recommendations Thank come you. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I don't have a reference to it. It's uh, 320 speaks, so uh, I think any should have been. I think it's incorporated. I yeah, I, I'm not going to worry about it. I, I, don't, I don't know. As I'm, I'm saying, I'm reading through it, so yeah, I would take a path. I would move Do on. Do we have any other questions on individual policies? Do you think we can move them all at once? And just take that one out. Take Which the one, one out that this, uh, the five. Well, five ninety is not in there. I was just it's referencing that we didn't put it in there. Oh, yeah, we great, good, 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 great. Yeah. I, so did, I didn't look there. Yeah. Great, perfect. So I move approval of um, 9.01 policy review um, for 5.2. 280, 5.285, 5.290, 5.300, 5.320, and the, um, the Board of Education Policy Section 5 and 6. No, that doesn't, that's just the. That's just the middle. Yep. Second. I have a motion and a second. Roll call. Roddy? Yes. Romberg? Yes. Lucky? Yes. Fitzgerald? Aye. Price? Yes. Motion carries. Thank you very much. And I think that is it. We've got a schedule of events and that's coming up. Dan has mentioned the um, marathon and half marathon that are going on this coming weekend. I'd also just highlight one of my uh, favorite uh, things we do every year is uh, in this district we are honored to be in school uh, on November 11th and uh, really appreciate the participation of local veterans. Uh, in helping our students understand the importance of uh, what our veterans do for our country. So looking forward to that great day and our partnership with uh, uh, veteran organizations in our community to help uh, our kids understand the importance of Veterans Day. Excellent. And then we are going back into closed session, renewing. So do we have to have a motion to go back into closed session? We have a motion to go back into closed session. It's just important to note uh, there is no action uh, that is planned to come as there a result no of closed session. There is no action planned again. So I need to read through the list again? Mm. Of the ones we're going to talk, talk about. Okay, so we need to. I need a motion to go back into closed session, and are we going to talk about the property? I think we've addressed that. Okay. Uh, I think uh, 2.05, uh, 2.04, 2.05, and 2.06 would be matters that I think we. Okay, so we. I need a motion to go into closed session for the purposes of collective negotiating matters between the district. Security procedures and the use of personnel and equipment to respond to an actual threat and student disciplinary case. So moved. Second. Motion and a second. On roll call. On roll call. Price. Yes. Fitzgerald. Aye. Yes. Wonky. Yep. Price. Yes. Thank you very much, everybody. Have a wonderful evening. Just let me go.